relative to infections of the eye, I'm going to divide this into uh, discussions on treating the three major areas. The cornea, which is the clear, transparent surface of the eye. The anterior chamber, which lies between the cornea and the iris filled with aqueous humor. I'll discuss that more. And then the posterior portion of the eye uh, containing the vitreous. For treatment of the cornea, I kind of um, divide this into uh, topical, subcon uh, subconjunctival, or systemic. The vast, vast majority of the time we use topicals to treat the cornea. Um, triple antibiotic still is out there. It's bacitracin, neomycin, and polymyxin B. Um, provides good broad coverage, bacitracin for your gram positives, neomycin for your staph, and a lot of your gram negatives, and polymyxin B for your gram negatives and pseudomonas. Uh, typically, I don't rely so much on it for uh, serious infections, but I will uh, use it in uh, milder keratitis infections, this sort of thing, prophylactic scenarios, this sort of thing. One issue to be familiar with is that there are some concerns that cats might be unusually allergic to a component of triple antibiotic, uh, such that some feline practitioners either don't want to prescribe it or uh, do so uh, with some caution. So the science behind this, how uh, much evidence supports this is unknown but it may be prudent to observe the cat uh, for the first 30 to 60 minutes after the first application of triple antibiotic to make sure there's no allergic reactions. Okay, uh, <coughs> And um, all these topicals you're going to want to apply no less than TID three times a day. Um, more commonly QID. Uh, other good ones to use for the cornea are chloramphenicol or a fluoroquinolone. We have no veterinary approved fluoroquinolone ophthalmics, but we certainly use the, um, the human products. Okay. These also have the advantage, as you'll see in the subsequent slide, of penetrating into the anterior chamber. But these are very good products. Um, <clears throat> for serious infections, particularly where pseudomonas is of concern, either a fluoroquinolone or an aminoglycoside is very commonly used. Okay. Now, um, uh, the aminoglycoside in veterinary medicine will use genomycin, but increasingly will use tobramycin. Tobramycin is a human-only ophthalmic. Uh, with very good activity against Pseudomonas. Um, because Pseudomonas is so aggressive, it can produce what's called a melting corneal ulcer, where the cornea actually dissolves because of the collagenase the Pseudomonas is producing. We'll be applying um, tobramycin uh, or fluoroquinolone drops hourly. Um, it's not uncommon for that reason to um, put in a palpebral catheter and set up a constant rate infusion of the antibiotic uh, to bathe the cornea. This is especially true in horses. Uh, Pseudomonas, because of that collagenase, will, will um, add acetylcysteine, sodium EDTA drops, uh, or quite commonly autogenous serum to try to neutralize that collagenase and inhibit damage to the cornea. Now, uh, if a palpebral catheter is not an option, one way of providing um, continuous antibiotic to the surface of the cornea is to go with subconjunctival injections. And here this is uh, where you take a small gauge needle, typically no bigger than a 25 gauge needle, and inject a small quantity of the antibiotic uh, on the bulbar conjunctiva after um, local anesthesia, and in small animals oftentimes short acting general anesthesia. Um, the antibiotic then leaks out of that small injection puncture to bathe the 
uh, cornea in antibiotic for 24 to 48 hours depending on the drug. Now you have to use a uh, non-irritating uh, drug if you're going to inject it subconjunctivally and mostly this has been aminoglycosides such as amikacin. In uh, large animals penicillin G has been used it's actually written up in humans as well, but uh, <coughs> uh, more commonly we'll see uh, amikacin or tobramycin injected subconjunctivally. Okay, uh, and systemic medications may be added to the topical if it's severe. Uh, most of the antibiotics will enter into the tears to some degree and um, uh, provide activity on the cornea and as well in some keratitis we start to see neovascularization where the uh, blood vessels start to ingrow into the cornea and, and there certainly systemic therapy uh, is helpful as would be a, a subconjunctival graft uh, to bring blood fl flow or blood supply to a uh, corneal ulcer for example. Now the next structure of the eye I'm going to talk about is the anterior chamber. Remember uh, from an anatomical viewpoint you have the cornea, uh, then deeper to that you have the anterior chamber which is full of the clear fluid called aqueous humor. Then you have the iris and then behind the iris is the posterior chamber with the ciliary body. The ciliary body does two main things. It uh, focuses the lens and it produces the aqueous humor that flows through the pupil into the anterior chamber and then is reabsorbed um, at the iridocorneal uh, angle. Okay, and then deeper to that we have the vitreous body or vitreous humor uh, and then the retina. Okay, so <coughs> uh, when we have inflammation of the anterior chamber and our infection. This is sometimes referred to as an anterior uveitis because it involves typically the uveal tract with the, uh, the iris and ciliary body. Okay. How do you know if you have uh, an infection in the anterior chamber? One tip off is that when you shine a light, normally it should be clear and uh, there should be no interference with that light going from the cornea through the iris back to the retina. If you're seeing a uh, fuzziness or flocculence, particularly uh, if you uh, view this sideways with the light, you'll see little uh, sparkles where the light is hitting pieces of protein and cellular debris. This is sometimes called aqueous flare and it's an indication of inflammation in the uh, anterior chamber which can be infection. Now there are non-infectious causes of anterior uveitis particularly in the horse there's a disease called periodic ophthalmia but in this case we're talking about infections. Okay. Now we can treat an anterior uveitis, uh, infectious anterior uveitis either topically and or systemically. Now to treat it topically, obviously we need a drug that will cross the cornea into the anterior chamber aqueous fluid. And there we have a limitation. Really the only two things that do this appreciably are topical chloramphenicol and topical, uh, and a topical fluoroquinolone. Okay. Both will penetrate the anterior or the intact cornea into the anterior chamber. Usually we're also going to treat systemically and the blood aqueous barrier is almost identical in anatomy to the blood brain barrier. So the same sorts of drugs that penetrate the blood brain barrier are used to penetrate the blood aqueous barrier. So again, human third generation cephalosporins, carbapenems, um, chloramphenicol, fluoroquinolones, and TMS, particularly the veterinary form of TMS though uh, certainly the fluoroquinolones are used a lot in this regard, but any of these could be done. Okay, so that's the anterior chamber. Now the vitreous is very difficult to penetrate and luckily it's fairly uncommon that we have vitriol infections. 
<coughs> again the same uh, penetration issues exist here systemically we would use those same drugs fluoroquinolone, chloramphenicol, or carbapenem Now it's not uh, something that I've ever done before, but ophthalmologists will inject antibiotics directly into the vitriol fluid to achieve high concentrations locally there. And here are just some examples uh, in the amounts of antibiotics that have been injected directly into the uh, vitreous of the eye. Uh, again, note that genomycin is not used because it is potentially toxic to the ciliary body and would destroy it and stop aqueous humor production. But a variety of other things can be injected. Uh, again, typically this is a, uh, a referral scenario. Uh, I addressed uh, use of voriconazole for topical corneal infections. Uh, deeper tissues we have to use an antifungal that penetrates that could be either fluconazole or vorconazole either one uh, both do well vorconazole has the advantage of the enhanced spectrum if you're not sure what you might have such as wondering if there's an aspergillus fluconazole certainly uh, the, the uh, lesser expensive of the two uh, unfortunately, uh, oftentimes the disease is fairly well advanced, so whether or not you can save the eye, uh, I would be a little uh, doubtful, but that's something to talk with an ophthalmologist about.